Hello everyone and welcome to the week 2 of our core systems integration and architecture. Our week 2 is the overview of systems integration challenges and drivers. By the time that you're watching this video, I hope that you are all safe and healthy. Now let's go over to the contents of our topic for this lesson. As the world continuously advances, business and organizations must keep pace and immediately adopt to these changes in order to take advantage of the benefits that technological advancement brings. Now for this lesson, here are our objectives. First, identify what is systems integration and enterprise resource planning. Second, determine what silos are all about and the different information systems in an organization. Third, understand the benefits and limitations of systems integration and its implication for management. And lastly, construct deeper understanding on the different roles of ERP, benefits and limits of ERP, and different types and vendors of ERP. So what is system integration? Accordingly, system integration implies that users permit an interdependent information system. When we say interdependent, this is connected from one another. One is dependent to the other or vice versa. To what? To communicate or connect as well as exchange information or data effortlessly amongst each other. Take note of the, good, the, the core word there, rather, that is to communicate or connect. Meaning when we say communicate or connect, there is a medium that we use to transfer the information or to conduct the exchange of information in forms of data. And the goal there is it should be done effortlessly, meaning it should be efficient. It should be effective. It should be optimized. So in a nutshell, that is system integration. As you can see in the picture, there are different types of systems like customer relationship management, revenue management systems, sales systems, reservation systems, all interdependent to one another using system integration. They are connected. They are integrated to one another. Lethonen defined system integration in its broadest sense as the act of linking several subsystems. Look at the word there, the act of linking several subsystems, or we call them components, into a cohesive, bigger system. Look at the term there, from subsystems or components into a cohesive, connected, bigger system that functions as a whole. When it comes to software, system integration is often understood as the practice of connecting disparate IT systems, services, and or software to make them all operate together operationally. That is the goal of system integration. Again, take a look at the picture there. There are different devices connected there, and there are different systems connected there. And using systems integration, we are able to put or to link together the different several subsystems or components into one big system that functions as a whole and operates smoothly, effectively for the organization's achievement of its goal. System integration involves combining all of the organization's physical and virtual components. There are two types of components, that is physical and virtual components, in which where we involve when we conduct system integration. Now, machine systems, computer hardware, inventories, and other physical components make up the physical component. On the other hand, 
data stored in databases, software, and applications make up the virtual components. So these are the different examples when pertains to physical and virtual components. Now the major emphasis of system integration is the process of integrating all of these components so that they operate as a single system. We should not uh, we should we should remove the or take out of the picture the idea that these systems are working independently. But rather, we have to consider the fact that all of these systems, all of these physical and virtual components are integrated in order to operate as a single system. And that is the goal of system integration. Integration of systems is a critical problem for an organization's growth. Now, in this slide, I want you to think of what makes it a critical problem. Why integrating different systems? For example, accounting system, enrollment system, grading system, and library management systems in a school setting, for example, huh, makes it a critical problem for the growth of organization. When the idea is to make it more optimized, when the idea is to make the process more connected, when the idea is to make the process more related from one to the other, what makes it a critical problem? Now, I hope as you listen to this discussion, you realize, you come to think of it, I will give you like 30 seconds to think what makes it a critical problem. So your 30 seconds starts now. Now, I hope that you have realized some of the reasons why integrating different types of system becomes a critical problem to an organization's growth. The integration aspect of the processes becomes exceedingly tough as the project has become more complicated with more users, more suppliers, more internal corporate procedures, and functions and subsystems. For example, let's go back to our example that we are trying to integrate library system, grading system, accounting system, and enrollment system in a school setting. Library system has its own set of users, set of suppliers, set of internal corporate procedures, functions, and subsystems, as well as the grading system, the accounting system, and the enrollment system. Now, let's try to integrate all of them. Imagine we are trying to integrate four systems with four sets of different features. Now, we add up to a more users, more suppliers, more internal corporate procedures, or more functions and subsystems, or are we trying to lessen the number of them? Now, that makes it a more critical problem for an organization. So, ensuring that integrating systems becomes not so critical problem is a challenge when we integrate systems. Here are some of the costs of problems in system integration. First, management. When we say management, we are not only pertaining to the group of people who manages the organizations, but also the practice, the procedures of managing the resources, and other essential elements needed for integrating systems. First, poor configuration management. Second, establishment of inadequate testing philosophy. Third, 
improper organization and assignment of responsibilities. For example, you are a data engineer and you are assigned as a data scientist. Now, your skill set is for data engineering, but the requirement for the data scientist role is way different from what you have been practicing for different for the for a number of a couple of years. So there is a mismatch there. So there might be some complications in terms of assignments of responsibilities. Deficient interrelationship of assembly, integration, and test in the project development. Test strategy and integration plan is not developed in time. Test tools and test infrastructure not available for system tests and insufficient time for testing. So here are some of the reasons or causes of problems in system integration as far as, far as management is concerned. Now let's talk about the Enterprise Resource Plan or the ERP. Let's first look at the picture in the right side of the screen. You see there the word ERP or the, the, the letters ERP connected to customer web portal, CRM and sales, distribution, time and projects, dashboards, finance, manufacturing, and purchasing. Imagine that all of these uh, elements surrounding the word ERP is independent or independent systems like we have our CRM system, we have our distribution system, we have our finance system. The goal of ERP is to connect all of those systems into one cohesive, large or, or uh, big system so that we can integrate from CRM to manufacturing, from finance to customer to distribution to purchasing. So that is the goal of an enterprise resource plan. Now, let's take a look at the definition of an ERP. So ERP systems are a type of information technology that enables businesses to connect, to connect many systems into a single enterprise-wide application with an integrated database management systems. So if we have different kinds of systems surrounding the ERP, for example, they are not connected yet. Purchasing has its own database, CRM has its own database, customer web portal has its own database. Now the goal when we put up there to when we put there in an ERP, when we set up an ERP is that to make those systems connect and establish an integrated database management system. So for example, the customer data from the customer web portal should be accessible to the purchasing system or should reflect to the finance system or even in CRM and sales. If they are independent, we have to consider the database structure so that the CRM would be able to read how data are being stored to purchasing, how products would be stored from manufacturing to distribution, and so on and so forth. So when we put them in a single big, large enterprise-wide application, we should integrate database so that it connects from one system to another. ERP stands for Enterprise Resource Plan, as you all know. And it is a sort of software that businesses often use to handle day-to-day -day operations including project management, accounting, supply, or supply chain rather, operations, procurement, risk management, and compliance. Imagine we don't have an ERP and we have process for payment. We have to go to uh, another process and then we have to go to another process like for example from PO to purchase order to service entry to service acceptable you know I know you have you have already experienced that uh, that scenario dealing in an organization without an enterprise resource plan or without system integrated from one office to another that it could take 
take some time or that is very time consuming. So imagine if those systems are interconnected with one another, it is easier to uh, access records from one system to another. In our example, in our school setting example, for example, for example, uh, your student number is your unique identifier. Now, when you enter a school by giving your student number, you are able to sign in into the log of all people entered in the system, in the security system of the, the school. Now, when you go to the library, you just have to give your student number so that you can borrow books and return books, if any. Then going to the grading system, you should only present your student number or student ID number to see your grades. Going to the clinic, they will get your student number and they would understand uh, what time did you enter the school, where did you go from one place to another inside the school campus, because all of the systems in the school is connected to one another. They only... Uh, they only serve their specific or intended functions relevant to their offices, but all of those offices are interconnected with one another. That is the, the goodness or the benefit of having ERP. So let's talk about functional silos, one of our objectives for today. So... According to the Webster definition, a silos is an airtight pit or tower for preserving foodstuffs. But silos are simply segregated functioning units that are cut, it, cut off from the rest of the environment. In a firm, functional silos are groups of personnel organized by function that operate independently of one another and without cross-collaboration. That is, in, in, in other words, silos is synonymous to assignments or uh, division of labors. If you remember the K-drama startup, they have their silos as well. They, uh, they have set of developers, they have set of designers, they have set of people who would present the output of their system or their project so they are interrelated but they do not cross collaborate they, they do not overlap responsibilities so later we will be able to learn more about silos so here are the classifications of Functional silos. Functional silos are divided into vertical and horizontal silos. When we say horizontal silos, from Henry Fayol, a management philosopher, he was the one to first separate the functionalized organization into five fundamental areas. So what are the five fundamental areas? First is planning. Second is organizing. Third, coordinating. Fourth is commanding. And fifth, controlling. It was done early 1900s. Luther Gullick expanded and theorized Fayol's categorization in the 1930s resulting in the POSDCORB or the post decorb functional model. So what is the post decorb functional model? It stands for planning, organizing, staffing, directing, coordinating, reporting, and budgeting. So if you notice, these are different departments or different uh, responsibilities in an organization. There are uh, specifics. There They have like department re, uh, responsible for planning, responsible for organizing, for staffing, for directing, coordinating, reporting, and budgeting. Starting in the late 1930s, the post corp category became increasingly popular, resulting in a set of formal organization roles such as control management, supervision, and administration. 
The language of organizational functions evolved over the following 50 years. For example, from planning to management to strategy, but the principle of organizing complicated tasks into structured functions persisted for control and coordination purposes. So take a look at the picture there. The POS, DC, RB, uh, from planning, organizing, staffing, directing, coordinating, reporting, and budgeting. So these are our horizontal silos in an organization. So what is vertical silos? In the late 1960s, Harvard University's Robert Anthony discovered that businesses split responsibilities in hierarchical stages from strategic planning through managerial control and operation control. So most institutions, for instance, have upper executives such as CEOs and presidents like COO, CFO, CTO, CIO. They manage long-term strategic plans. So that is the responsibility of the upper management. Although middle le uh, so although middle-level leadership like vice presidents or general managers concentrates on strategic concerns and the implementation of company strategy to ensure that the company meets its organizational plan. The job of middle position, for example, the supervisors, is to concentrate on the business daily operation functions. Although not independent organizational roles, this vertical category does entail a different set of activities. Imagine, ha? Huh? In a vertical silos, we have the upper level, the middle level, and the lower level. In the upper level, we see there the CEO, the president, they manage long term. In the middle level, they are the vice presidents, the general managers. They concentrate on how to implement these uh, strategies, how to implement these strategic plans. And in the lower level, for example, the supervisors, they concentrate on daily operations, on how to achieve the strategic goal uh, cascaded from them by the middle manager. So this is the graphical representation of that. In the upper uh, portion, that is the strategic management in the middle level, tactical management. What are the tactical management activities that should be done to achieve the strategic management goal? And then the functional operation, the lower, lower part of the hierarchy is on how to achieve the tactical operations in a day-to-day -day -day management so that it contributes to the overall achievement of the strategic management. Okay, so let's talk about information systems in organizations. Today, successful organizations rely heavily on IS. IS are important because they process data from corporate inputs to provide information that can be used to manage business operations. Some of the applications of IS in organizations are business communication systems, business operations management, company decision making, and company recording key. So there is this thing that we call functional silos and information systems in an organization. So each functional area has its own set of information and reporting demands. There are numerous layers of management in each functional areas of a company, which needing varying levels of analysis and knowledge depth. Organizations establish diverse information system to support each key operation and duty in order to boost efficiency and production. If you can still recall the three levels from uh, the strategic to tactical to func functional, in the functional level, we deploy different kinds of information systems to support different processes by different departments. Here, we use different kinds of systems or information systems so that we would be able to achieve the goals of each functions. Now take a look at the image there. We have different uh, information, information systems like payroll, like billing, like sales, assets, and the like. So it is in the functional level that we deploy different kinds of information systems. Here, to uh, display more graphically, 
in the strategic planning level, uh, under unstructured uh, requirements are given in terms of decision requirements in the management, semi-structured, and in operational that is structured. So, from the bottom part to the top level most part, we see their connections like finance function, human resources, accounting, operation, and marketing. So, ad hoc unscheduled summarized infrequent forward-looking external wide scope. That is what we see there in the uppermost level. And in the lower level, we see pre-specified, scheduled, detailed, frequent, historical, internal, narrow focus. So, information systems and systems integration. Over time, corporations develop a jumble of unconnected, non-integrated systems which resulted in bottlenecks and slowed production. That is the effect of having uh, unconnected or non-integrated systems. Organizations must be nimble and adaptable, and their information systems must include data, applications, and resources from several departments. Now, I would again give you like 10, 10 to 15 seconds to think of what kind of systems uh, do you think can be connected from one another? Aside from our example a while ago, think of five systems that can be connected from one another as a whole or a large type of system. So your 15 seconds starts now. Okay, time's up. I hope that you would be you were able to think of at least five systems that you can connect from one another aside from our example a while ago. A data silo system is inefficient, incorrect, and costly. Everyone has bottlenecks as a result of the system, and information is not available in real time. That is the disadvantage of having unconnected and non-integrated systems. Organizations must be customer-centric in order to complete, compete effectively. The necessitates cro this necessitates rather cross-functional collaboration between the company's accounting, marketing, and other divisions. People and resources from diverse functional areas can collaborate and share information at a certain level of the organization through cross-functional integration. By allowing information to flow freely from one unit to another, the cross-functional organizational structure breaks down functional silos. Now, let's go back to my question a while ago. What kind of five systems can you think of and then you'd be able to integrate from one another? Now, I will give you mine. For example, in, a, in an inventory system, we can have ordering system. We can have purchasing system. We can have the product monitoring system. We can have customer relationship management system, and we can have point of sale system, all in one in an inventory management system with point of sale system. Now, here's the implications of system integration for management. Many new ethical dilemmas arise as a result of system integration. There's a chance that some workers will use information for personal gain or get unauthorized access of it. That is one of the implications when we integrate systems because they are able to access or have the possibility to access information from one system to another. Let's go back to the school setting that we have a while ago. For example, I am working in the clinic and then I want to check what kind of books you are trying to borrow every now and then. So I would go to the library system because you are connected to that. Our system are connect is connected to that. So I can check your borrowings and returns or I can go to the accounting system. So the challenge there is to put restriction. The responsibility, for example, for a clinic management system should be only 
limited to the operation of the clinic. Same goes with the library, with the accounting, with the grading, with the enrollment, and so on. In order to prevent workers or other users to access information that are not relevant to them or to their operation or their office procedures, there should be some restrictions or level of access from one user to another. Implementing rules on ethical information usage, installing suitable security software and hardware such as firewalls, and allocating resources for information access training and education are all possible remedies. Integrated Systems Enterprise Resource Planning ERP's purpose is to bring together all of an organization's departments and operations into a single infrastructure that shares a common database and meets the demands of each department. Shares a common database that meets the demands of each department. ERP systems are designed to replace a variety of systems that are often seen in businesses. Furthermore, ERP handles the difficult challenge of integrating data from many sources and making it available in real time. So we are, for example, in our school setting, we, would, we want to, to eliminate the, re, the redundant processes of getting student information from one process to another. For example, in the clinic, they will ask you your basic information and then when you go to the library, they also ask your student information and then you again write your information in a piece of paper or encode it to the system. And then you go to the sports, clinic, sports center, for example, and then they will get again your, your information, your student number, and so on and so forth. And when we integrate the systems, there will be no need to do that anymore because all of the information for the schools are interconnected to one another with restrictions, for example, with restrictions, of course, based on the needs of the office owner. So here is an example of how integration or ERP system looks like from clients, employees, and vendors to internet to the GUI tools. That is just one of the representations of ERP. So ERP systems are multi-module, integrated software packages that service and support a variety of business operations across a company. They are generally commercial software packages that allow for the collection and integration of data from multiple departments within a company. Now that is the the first course outcome or goal of uh, intended course outcome of this course and that is to make you decide or help you decide when to insource or outsource but typically the ERP is a vendor base they are provided uh, from different kinds of vendors and they are responsible for integrating different systems in an organization this system enables the company to standardize and optimize its business operations in order to apply industry best practices. ERP systems are the first phase of enterprise applications that were needed to implement information that supports all of an organization's primary operations. ERP systems combine the organization's many functional areas and also the systems of its partners and suppliers. Again, take a look at the picture there. This is another example of an enterprise resource plan with different systems connected from one to the other. ERP solutions force companies to concentrate on business processes rather than functions. ERP systems have procedures built in for a wide range of common company operation. In terms of processing a client order, an ERP system applies best practices via particular built-in stages. So what are these stages? One, order input. Second, routing by department. And third, transmission of output to various stakeholders. An enterprise may need to upgrade or install middleware as well as get rid of their old systems, hardware, and software before deploying the ERP system. Take a look at that uh, reality when you use ERP. Huh? You need to upgrade or to install middleware because Middleware are very essential components of an ERP, in an ERP. And to consider either to upgrade or get rid, remove the old systems and hardwares and softwares that you have been using because they might be not compatible to the existing ERP system that you want to deploy. 
data integration, client integration, and application integration are all essential components of integration. When we integrate, we do not only integrate the system per se. We do not only focus on the infrastructure alone. When we integrate, we integrate also the data. That is why I mentioned a while ago that you, if, if you have different kinds of system with different kinds of databases, you have to consider the structure of the database of one system to another so that you can easily integrate them in one big database. Client integration, you have to consider also how are you going to integrate one client, the other client, and the application integration, the different kinds of systems connected should be considered. So data client and application integrations are very essential components of system integration. Without superior business procedures that focus on company goals rather than particular organizational objectives, an effective ERP installation enhances efficiency and productivity. Increased productivity through a seamless workflow and a B2B or business-to-business -business transaction ecosystem with collaborators. So when we put up an ERP, we have to consider different uh, effective business procedures that conforms with the organization's objectives and goals that they want to achieve because these procedures are uh, instrumental in deploying the ERP and for the ERP to work seamlessly. So if an organization doesn't have a superior or very concrete business procedures and uh, the what they only have are different uh, contextualized business procedures based on different departments, then that may be a challenging task for integrating the system. So when you change the system, when you integrate the system, you also have to consider how are you going to enhance or improve the business processes so that it can conform or it conforms to the existing need or uh, to the existing processes that would be happening. So this is the evolution of uh, ERP. So in 1960s, started with inventory control packages. So they have this concept called inventory control packages, followed by material requirements planning or MRP that happens in 1970s. In 1980s, Manufacturing Resource Planning or MRPII happened. And in 1990s, Enterprise Resource Planning were introduced. And in 2000s, extended ERP are continued. And in the recent years, it has been improved, it has been enhanced so that it can uh, it can conform, it can cater to the, exchange, uh, to the existing demands and challenges and to the ever-growing demands of the different sectors and industries. So here is a summary or sample summary of the evolution of ERP. You can take a look and read from 1960s to 2000s about the different platforms used by different systems. So looking at the difference between e-business or electronic business and ERP, this is the difference of them. In electronic business, it focuses on linking a business with uh, its external partners and stakeholders, while in ERP, it focuses on integrating the internal functional silos of the organization into an enterprise application. In e-businesses, disruptive technology are employed, totally transform the way a business operates in terms of buying and selling, customer service, and relationships with suppliers. While in ERP, adaptive technology are employed, merge the early data processing and integration efforts within an organization. So what are the different uh, system components of ERP? So ERP systems is composed of hardware like servers and peripherals, software processes like operating systems and database, information like organizational data from internal and external sources, 
process, business processes, procedures and policies, and people, and users and IT staff. The ERP architecture looks like this one. The budget, operation, and the use of an ERP system are all influenced by the system's architecture. The ERP architecture aids the deployment team in developing the institution's ERP system. When ERP is acquired, the vendor is frequently in charge of the architecture. So, there are two types of architectures. The logical focuses on the supporting needs of the end user and the physical focuses on the efficiency of the system. Now, look at the architecture there. It has hardware, it has data or the database, the core business logic or the security access, and the functional business applications. Here are just some of the functional business applications in an ERP, like accounting, supply chain, distribution, finance, HRM, marketing, production. You can also have others depending on the needs of the organization in terms of the functional business applications. And then the client user interface application and the end user. So that is the entire ERP architecture. We start from considering the hardware to the data, to the security, to the different applications, to the client user interface. So we are not only looking at how are we going to connect one area to another, but rather we are trying to identify each part of the ERP. Tiered architecture example of ERP system. Presentation logic tier, business logic tier, and data tier. System benefits of ERP. Cross-functional integration of data and applications. Like data can be entered once and used by all applications. That is what I'm talking about about a while ago when you enter your student number and then you go to different offices with different kinds of applications or systems, they can be able to easily access your records and uh, have an information of who you are, your inform basic information, where you're from, what is your section, and what is your course because all of the systems from the uh, school is interconnected to one another. And that improves accuracy and quality of the data. Imagine if the system from a clinic to library is not integrated, you can just put different address to different system. Like you put different address to your clinic management system and then you put another address in the library system so that there is a data redundancy or data inconsistency in there. Whereas compared if all of those systems are interconnected to one another, uh, we can ensure that accuracy is prioritized, that accuracy is there, and that data are accurate and reliable. Improvements in maintenance and support as IT staff is centralized. User interface coherence across programs means less staffing tra staff training, more productivity, and cross-functional job mobility. Better controls and centralization of hardware, improved data, and application security. So here are some of the three benefits of having enterprise resource. But here are some of the limitations of it. First, the complexity of installing, configuring, and maintaining a system grows. As more systems are integrated, as more users are involved, as more components are added to the system integration, necessitating the use of expert IT personnel, hardware, and network infrastructure. Now, when the system grows, we need more skilled people. And when we say we need more skilled people, that requires us also to spend, to spend a little more because uh, the, the talent, the talent fee of those experts is way different from the talent fee of someone who is just starting uh, his or her job. IT hardware, software, and human resource consolidation can be time-consuming and difficult to achieve. Moving data from an old system to a new one can be a time-consuming and different, difficult procedure. Imagine you're using an old system and then you try to, to use a new one with different set of data, data fields. The structure of the database is different from the old to the new, but you have also to migrate the data. For example, imagine uh, we are using a new system 
and then we have been using an old system. If in the event that the old system has a different data st data database structure to the new one, there might some challenges in migrating the data from the old system to another to the new one. So if if that's the case, it may be time consuming, it may be difficult to migrate the data, but it can be done. But again, it may be time consuming. IT employees and end users of the new system may need to be retrained because what they know might not be applicable to the current demands of the new system. It may cause resistance and lower productivity because some old uh, employees do not wish to be retrained. As the saying goes, old dogs may be hard to train with new tricks. So, that is the problem there. That is one of the limits of ERP. So, if, if, if we have seasoned uh, employees who have been accustomed to, accustomed to using the old system and then you migrate to the new system and they don't know how to use it uh, anymore, so you have to retrain them, but some hesitance or resistance rather can be uh, experience and that might cause to certain level of productivity. So if you are the manager, what would you do if you have old employees who have been accustomed to using the old system but then you employed a new system and they have been resisting to be retrained? What are you going to do as a manager? Now, come to think of it, I will give you 15 seconds. Ready? So your 15 seconds starts now. Okay, time's up. So that's the question there. Time's up. So business benefits of ERP. Organizational agility in terms of adapting to changes in the environment in order to gain and sustain market share. Employee cooperation is aided by information sharing across functional domains. Improving efficiency by linking and sharing data in real time with supply chain partners leads to cheaper cost, improve customer service as a result of faster information, flow across departments, and the re-engineering of business processes improves the efficiency of business operations. So here are some of the benefits uh, that the business can have or can take from using ERP. Limits, it might be costly and time-consuming to retrain all personnel on the new system. That is what we have been talking about. Upheaval and opposition to new systems might result from changes in business responsibilities and department boundaries. So guidelines in implementing ERP. A company must plan and understand the life cycle of ERP system before installing it. Understanding it is very important before you install it. You do not install it immediately without understanding how it uses or how it works. The key to a successful deployment is to follow a tried and true methodology, not a trial and error because it may cost you a lot. Take things slowly and start with grasp of an ERP life cycle. You start with small. ERP system installations are extremely dangerous and employing a well-defined project plan with a tried and true methodology can help mitigate those risks. And to make the switch from existing information systems or applications to an ERP system, there must be a compelling and well-communicated requirement. So here are some of the guidelines when in an organization or when, when time comes that you have to implement an ERP. Software and vendor selection. 
it is preferable for a company to that does not have experience designing ERP system to buy one off the shelf. So if you don't have experience in using ERP, it is suggested that you purchase a vendor-based or off-the-shelf commercial products. Before deciding on a provider, the company must assess its existing and future enterprise management system requirements. Do not just buy. You have to think of the long-term benefits and effects of it. Examine the organization's existing hardware. Can you sustain it? Are you going to change the existing hardware when you purchase an ERP? Or can the ERP adapt to the existing hardware of the organization? As well, network and software infrastructure as well as the implementation resources available. So these are the evaluation criteria for vendor. Business functions or modules supported by their software. Is the vendor supports the business functions that you need? Features and integration capabilities of the software. Can we easily integrate it? Can we easily apply it? Does the feature solve what we need to do? Financial viability of the vendor as well as length of time they have been in the business. Are they new to the business or are they established one? So we have to consider that as well. Licensing and upgrade policies. Are they going to upgrade the system every six months, every one year, every two months, every three years? What are the upgrade policies? What are the licensing policies? Customer service and help desk support. Do they provide the help desk support? Do they provide customer support when we need them? Total cost of ownership. Is it a 100% ownership or are just for lease? What are the grounds? IT infrastructure requirements. Do we have to buy a new set or can they adapt to what we have? Third party software integration, legacy statement support and integration. Consulting and training services. Is the vendor provider uh, would provide us training services and consultations when we apply their ERP to our organization. And future goals and plans for the short and long term. Operation and post-implementation. One of the most significant milestones in a project's success is when it goes live. When we go live. That is very significant. It is critical that all project team members coordinate their efforts to ensure that all tasks and activities are accomplished prior to going live. So five areas of stabilization are important. Training for end users, reactive support like help desk for troubleshooting, auditing support to make sure data quality is not comprised by new system, data fix to resolve data migration and errors revealed by audits, and new features and functionalities to support the evolving needs of the organization. ERP vendor examples like SAP. SAP is the world's most popular ERP software with over 12 million users worldwide. Its products are suitable for a wide range of industries and markets. Oracle or PeopleSoft is the second largest ERP provider, offers solution categorized by industry and pledges long-term support for PeopleSoft users. Microsoft Dynamics, formerly known as Microsoft Business Solutions or Great Plains, is a complete business management system based on the Microsoft platform. In four, the world's third largest corporate software vendor. It provides integrated supply chain, customer relationship, and supplier management solutions. Lawson, Enterprise Performance Management Distribution Financials, Human Resources, Procurement, and Retail Operations are all examples of industry-specific software solutions. Come 2022, when all of you are in the industry, you might have uh, encountered or you may be using some of the ERP vendors available as shown in the example. So that ends our solution. That ends our lesson, rather. I hope that you learned something from our discussion. And if you have questions, you can just send it to our group chat. And for clarifications, you can send your questions to our group chat. That ends 
for today. Please take care always and bye-bye.